turn to Scottish so we can read Scottish. There you go. That came from downstairs. All right, everybody, we're back. It's e- ethnic stereotyping, you realize. Everybody. <laughs> Coming up next, Irish legend Shane Horgan. Brought to you by Friends of the British Council. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Talking rugby at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 here in Midtown Manhattan. And we have an international flavor today in our segment with the debonair Steve Lewis of Scotland. Yes. Good afternoon. And yes. And the gorgeous uh, long man from Meath, uh, Shane Horgan. Meath, that's very specific. I feel as if I, I'm very underdressed as well. You're looking very smart. And well, I, he does I'm like a hobo course. here. Yeah, he does. It. Well, you're shaggy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not for a while. Yeah. I haven't been shaggy for a while. <laughs> that's brought back some horrific memories, but thank you. No, no worries. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. That's all what right. bring back memories. All right, so first of all, welcome. In Thanks all so many. No, I love it. My, my uh, I think maybe my favorite city in the world. Uh, absolutely love that. I spent a few months here on a few different occasions, and um, it's nice to get back. So when you were a, uh, a schoolboy playing rugby at uh, Droyida? Drohada. Dro- Droyida? Drohada, yeah. We, did you ever uh, dream of being in a, in a studio, in a bar, in a hotel in New York City talking professional rugby? Well, certainly not talking professional rugby. I may, may have thought of <laughs> being, in a, <laughs> yeah. being in a bar in New York isn't beyond the wildest dreams of a, of a man from Drohada. But uh, speaking about professional rugby, um, certainly wasn't on the cards because, of course, you know, I grew up in an era that um, rugby wasn't professional. It was an amateur game. It was never a job that I thought I was going to be doing for a living. Right. So I was the first generation, uh, my generation in Ireland was the first ones uh, who had the opportunity to make a decision at 18 to, to, to play rugby for a living. Um, and we certainly weren't doing it for the money, but uh, right. it was brilliant to be able to, to do something um, and follow your passion and, and do it as a job, which uh, we never, never thought that was an option. So first question out of the gate, what are you, about 18.6 hands high? I don't. I don't. Am I judging by horse? Is that how they? Is that how you? Sixteen, sixteen, I'm five. I'm stone? about six. I'm about six four when I straighten up, right. and uh, I don't know my weight. But my fighting weight was around. Um, I, I'm going to kill you now with a me- with a metric sure. terms. So I was about a, I was about 105 kilos of fighting weight. I've dropped off a few since then. Do, do, but, uh, we have the Scottish man. I'm even older. I, I talk stones. I'm 12 stone too. <laughs> but I, I would like to ask you about the the start of pro rugby in Ireland. So the Pro 14 or the Celtic League or whatever it was at the time. So obviously, as you know, we're embarking on this adventure here. Um, crowds are you know two, three, four thousand here right now, which I think is is fine. Um, what were the equivalent? I know Glasgow was poor. It's where I'm from, who I played for, and I know Connaught. He's got a Glasgow cap. Yeah, yeah just the one. Now, um, so how would you, you feel the comparison when it started over there? There's certainly a strong comparison. I, I think the game in, in Ireland was slightly different in that it was very um, grounded in, in the club game. Um, and they would have got, there was something called the All Ireland League, which was an amateur league back then, and it got decent crowds. But um, the first professional league was based around the provinces and my province was Leinster and prior to the league starting up there was only maybe um, six games per year potentially for Mm -hmm. Leinster you'd play the other provinces uh, you might play them twice and then you'd have a a short run in a European competition which was an an abridged version of the one that we have now so there wasn't a lot of games the first game I ever played for Leinster um, I was 18 years of age we were playing in the place called Dura Doyle, uh, which is uh, Gary Owen's ground in, in Limerick. W- wasn't a big enough um, game to play in, in Thomond, and there was 300 people at the game. Wow. So that's the kind of base level we were... And listen, I knew most of the 300 people who were there. Yeah. You know, you could, you could spot your mum and your dad and your, and your brothers and your sister. So that's the level that mm-hmm. they were coming from. And the explosive growth that happened in, in Irish rugby and indeed, you know, I suppose, you know, Celtic rugby, as it were, over the next 10 years was ridiculous. We got to the point, um, I think it was in 2009, when Leinster played Munster in the European Cup semi-final in Crow Park, which at the time had a world record attendance uh, of over 90,000. So that was, the, that was the level of growth. Now, I know there's, you know, there's a, a lot of differences between the game here and the game uh, back home. And um, you know, I think that growth, um, there was a lot of reasons for that growth, that, that, that some of them historic, uh, that don't necessarily equate to what's going on here. But you know, if you get your product right, if you engage your fan base and you, um, you have people um, uh, interested in, in the sport and passionate about it, then growth can be really significant. And that's what it was with Leinster. So 
you you mentioned you were 18 when you were faced with that choice of professional rugby. It's kind of similar. It mirrors what's going on here right now. And you are, if I'm not mistaken, involved somewhat with the Rugby United New York squad yeah. as a consultant. Yeah, I'm just he- helping uh, James out. Who is James Kennedy is uh, is the owner of the franchise, and you know we've been. Talking. Can you understand him when he speaks? Listen, we're, we're like, us Irish people can all understand each other just well, about. I can understand you perfectly. I've got better diction than James. <laughs> but, <laughs> not, not, not hard. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I've been just involved with them as, a, as you know, advisor in a, in a pretty relaxed um, um, way over the last, um, you know, I suppose it's been you know 18 odd months now. Yeah. I know James for a bit longer than that. Um, he's so incredibly ins- excited and passionate about what, what he's doing and an incredible opportunity for for rugby in, in the United States, and there, it is an anomaly that there isn't, um, you know, a professional league here, or that hasn't one hasn't been able to be established. And um, you know, it, it, I think what's important is that there's baby steps taken along the along the uh, road here. You know, it doesn't everything doesn't have to be done at once. And you know, judging yourself over against you know, you know traditional sports that have a you know a big uh, background here or, or different uh, certainly a different uh, background than um, than rugby i think is dangerous but what you can have is you, you or what you do have is a you know a really strong um, growth in the, of the game you've got a, like a big collegiate system you've got a lot of player a lot more players playing it like more than certainly people at home would recognize so you do have an automatic feeder into you know these hubs which are the franchises and and i think now you've got players or you've got kids that will ha- will see this opportunity to play a pathway know, a pathway and yeah. that's that's why people that's why kids do extra training sessions it's why they do extra weight sessions it's why you know they don't go out uh, as much or it's why they you know commit to a team it's because they can see an opportunity not to be to make themselves a fortune but to be able to play something that they love um at a, at a high level and and maybe be given a helping a helping hand financially but also being exposed to good coaches and a, and a professional setup and i think it's very important to have that pathway and have that um, you know that opportunity for young players listen a lot of the players that i played with at 18 didn't all go fully professional at right. that time right. like i was still in university and i think that's a big opportunity for for the league here um what cuz what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of young players um immediately joining these clubs because there's not a historic um, background of you know, 10 years of professional rugby so, so the best players are going to be your, your young players coming through and they don't have to make the decision to go entirely professional at this point they can continue on with their college life and um, and play rugby and then that be supplemented by some full-time professionals as well so I think you've got a good mix or potentially have a really good mix what would you say ab- about the comparison with when Scotland started with the professional setup and what you saw as the director of rugby with Pro Rugby USA. Well, I, th- I think the onset of professionalism was um, was poorly handled, certainly in Scotland. And actually, in, in most tier one countries, it was it was problematic, right? It wasn't a smooth transition. Um, we in America right now have our own governance problems. Um, and so for people to expect that it's going to be it's easy, you know, it's, it's just unrealistic. It's not going to be linear. There's going to be litigation there's going to be mergers there's going to be some failures um but that's okay i mean everybody it, has the answer no right? no, no one has everybody that's not involved in it has yeah the no one has the answer that's right. the problem but anyway as you said passionate people uh allied to good business people you know we'll get there we'll get there um so this year doesn't have to be perfect pro rugby wasn't perfect it was a start this is the second iteration this year won't be perfect but it's better already right and then it'll get better and better and better so i I, for one i'm very positive and so if you look at the lessons of other rugby countries there's there's nothing really here to worry about it's just we try and learn from some of the mistakes and um and have a faster perhaps transition all right we're going to take a very quick break and we'll be right back with mr shane horgan and mr steve lewis right after this blind since I was four and I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label none of that stuff influences me I drink beer because of the taste and my beer is Pabst Blue Ribbon it has the taste and the flavor 
What do you think is on the label? I think there's a, a naked woman riding on a unicorn, jumping over fire. Oh, that's good beer. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. Hey, everybody, we're back at Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 in Midtown Manhattan with Mr. Shane Horgan and Mr. Steve Lewis. Shane, before we continue our conversation, which is going to cover Pro 14 a little bit, how do you explain the fact that your sister's a film star? She is, yeah, she is. My sister, I'm very proud of her. She's, um, she's um, certainly much more f- famous than me all of a sudden. Sharon? <laughs> Sharon, yes. yeah. So yes. she's, uh, yeah, she stars in uh, Catastrophe, a show. It's, I think it's shown on Amazon over here. It yes, is, yeah. yes. And she also wrote Divorce. That's, um, yeah, that's so she's also a writer as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. Yeah, no, she's uh, she's over here a bit actually. She's uh, she does the rounds over here every so often. Excellent. We'll have to get her in the studio and talk some rugby with yeah. her as well, right? <laughs> Let's talk Pro 14 rugby because that's they've got some stuff going on there. That's a professional setup that's that's scrapping a little bit. Um, I got to ask one question: Is it a little odd because you're now you're you're now in part of this uh, MLR thing, and we have owners owning teams. Like in America, everybody owns a team, mm-hmm. right? It's not like there's a, a union that runs the squads. Ireland, you have the IRFU. They're basically running the Pro 14. Um, well, no, they're not basically running the Pro 14. They're running the Pro 14 Irish franchises. And so the Scottish Union runs the um, Scottish uh, franchises as well, which is Glasgow and Edinburgh. You've got the Welsh ones, a slightly different um, um, model where um, there are individual owners for the clubs, right. but they're very highly uh, supplemented by or, or wouldn't really exist without the union. In Italy, they're both uh, union franchises. Well, the South African teams, yeah, they're both union franchises. I think they're part, they're part ownership models as well. So, again, they're owned somewhat by um, the uh, union, but also somewhat by uh, the, individual the IRF, investors. The well. IRFU drives the bus. Kind of like the way the NZRU drives the bus well, for Super Rugby, no? Well, uh, no, I, I would say the, there's the major sh- shareholders in the league are, are the different unions. So the IRFU, the Scottish Union, uh, the Italians, and um, also the, uh, the Welsh. So, uh, yes, it's the governing bodies, in effect, that, that, that run it. Um, in, s- that, that in some ways, that's been really positive for Ireland. Um, you know, the use of the players. Managing the players. Managing better, the right? players is, is, is really important. Um, and um, you know the main the main reason that, that Ireland want to control their players is because their priority is is the Irish um, you know national team. But uh, you know that's the most important thing. Um, that's the, certainly the priority for Ireland. So it's, it's difficult to manage that and have a team that's successful in the Pro 12 and then have teams that are successful in in EPCR and in the Champions Cup as well. But they've managed to do it. And you know we're talking about that original. Um, start up of professional rugby in, in the in the Northern Hemisphere in the Pro 12 and, and in Ireland in particular and Ireland was lucky in that it was divided b- by prov- province naturally geographically which meant we had four professional right. teams right. you know coming from a, a base where we had and you know very many uh, amateur club teams and far too many to go into a European competition but there was a natural split and a historic split um, with four now provinces which are, are the professional clubs so you know I know Scotland struggled for a long time le- losing you know one of the heartlands of, of rugby yeah. which is the borders, borders yep. they'd never been able to, to get that back or really get it together it was really surprising to me that that, that, that went by the, the wayside but Ireland has been lucky it's been able to hand, ha- hold on to its, its four teams but you know there are you know there are struggles with the Pro 14 League at the moment uh, uh, as well, and you know the new South African franchises have come in. That was talking about maybe bringing a US uh, franchise or Canadian franchise in. So um, well, that, that, br- that, br- that brings us back to the, maybe a conflict of cultures in in that in that kind of financial setup because there's no way in hell American fans are going to get around the, or embrace the fact that their team isn't owned by an owner that can really just do whatever the heck he wants to make the team better. Well, I think you know that may have been the model that would have been here they would have you could have had a, a club being the own uh, an individual being the owner of the club certainly um, and they would then play in the league and have a, a, a part ownership of that league. You know, I would say yeah. that's probably the way they may have looked to structure it. Now I'm not not privy to exactly how they tried to do it, but um, I think if you if you look at the way the European Cup is structured or, or the Champions Cup as it were, they some of the teams are like 
like the Irish teams that are owned by uh, the uh, b- by the national governing body, and then there's the English teams and the French teams that are bo- owned by individuals. So it can bring their players into the ground. So you know, and the, but uh, it can it can work side by side, but it's it's more difficult, and it's one of the reasons why the European market is very fragmented, yeah. and it's one of the reasons why um, it, there's difficulties in raising you know funds for these leagues because there's a lot of of teams that are and leagues cannibalizing each other, and and uh, there's a lot of rugby being played at the moment, and not all of it's high quality. So, so on that point, that um, do you consider? Would you consider the South African expansion a decision to go there? Do you think that's a success or wait and see? I think it's a bit too early to say whether it's success yet. I don't know how much um, income they're generating from from it. Uh, the new model of two conferences, I think, has been okay. The, the standard of rugby again, it's been okay. It hasn't been you know incredibly in- exciting. I think the travel has been a, a somewhat of a challenge. But I think we also need to give this a bit of time to see whether it's uh, whether how it'll bed in, how these um, franchises from South Africa will grow and develop and strengthen, and how they'll start to become and if they will start to be become more competitive because it was definitely a reaction to the strength of the French uh, top 14 and the English Premiership and trying to open the markets a, a bit wider to more people. You look at the, um, you know, France has a big population, the United Kingdom has a big population, England has a big rugby playing population and watching population. You know, between Ireland, Scotland, Wales and Italy, it's not that big. So any move to open that up uh, and it's the same time zone in effect with South African teams, I think it's not a bad idea. Yeah, so let me ask you this question. What do you think? Like, I'd be interested in what's your yeah, opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think with the South Africans, the, the same time zone is something that helps, even though it's uh, travel is an issue. Yeah. I think, um, I think the Pro 14 was so, and Martin and I were so keen to make a move last year. I mean, they were yeah. they were very keen to be over here. They courted a lot of people yeah. hard over here, and then the new shiny thing came in, which was the South Africans, and they went for that. And I think they've, they've made that bed, so they've got to go with it for a couple of years. They've got a couple of those guys, Erasmus, bad, on the bad. board now. No, I, I think, as you say, they've got to, they've got to go with it now. Um, back to on the field, Pro, Pro 14 teams had a good year, particularly in European Cup and European competition. And an Italian team with 11 wins. Yeah, yeah. Which, was, which was the most remarkable, I have to say. And, and we, uh, we haven't seen anything like that since, since Connacht a few years ago, who actually won the league, which was uh, amazing from being, you know, the, the 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 last or second last team for a few years before you that had the Kings with one win yeah but you know losses yeah right? but that's you know that's a, in the first year in the league that doesn't surprise me massively you know what would be more concerning if you know if there's something similar to that next year or if there's a big fall away from the Italian clubs but we need the the league competitive and at the moment there's a big I think there's quite a substantial difference between the best clubs and the worst clubs but what we have seen I think over the last four years in um, Pro 12 and Pro 14 rugby as it's now is we're seeing a blueprint of how teams with l- less resources can compete at the highest level uh, in Europe and we've seen that with you know um, with Connacht uh, originally about three years ago Glasgow the yeah. type of rugby they played you know the high skill level the interplay between forwards and backs Leinster but a more traditional team but they are certainly playing a, that uh, type of in, you know very um, conjoined game between forwards and backs very, <laughs> very, very high very high skill <laughs> and then um, we've seen um, Scarlets as well play in a very um, expansive in, you know very uh, progressive type of rugby you and mean the Welsh national team well it it's almost seems like that <laughs> at the moment doesn't it but so you know we've, we've seen them you know play in this in this more expansive way and they've had great success so I think there is a and, and then even in the premier, uh, Premiership in England we've seen Exeter almost take that model and implement it and make it successful as well so I, you know, it's a, I think it's a really good thing for smaller teams to go actually we don't have to have the massive you know, bulky physical men we can also do this with you know, a more refined skillful game and, and you can't you, know, you don't bring a knight so to a gunfight So says the guy that steamrolled every opposition's wing including <laughs> is Reese Williams still see you in his nightmares? Or? <laughs> well <laughs> it was certainly well. I, d- I had a few inches on Reese. The fact that you you oh well, it's size, the size doesn't matter. I'm just. <laughs> Come on. Listen, you know, I think it's not just, you know, the size of players, but I think it's the way that they play the game as well. And and there is, listen, there's there's a time when you can steamroller. But, you know, I think if you're competing against the big boys, the big French clubs in Europe, the big English clubs, they're always going to be more, sort of more bulky. They're going to be have more access to, to, to uh, financial resources to bring in those types of players. I think if you want to compete, and it's, I think it's a lesson for teams that are setting up now in, in the States to think, you know, th- think about, you know, a very very high skill based game and that's a way to compete with with any opposition all right well we, we are basically out of time but i got i got i got a final question for you 
Any estimate on how many pints the Irish folks bought you after that try against England at Twickenham? Well, I don't want to put a limit on it because I'm still getting points <laughs> from base on that. So <laughs> it's uh, the gift that keeps on giving. It's a gift yeah. that keeps on giving. I remember I was giving a, a talk to some um, some young players the other day in an academy in Ireland, and you know they were saying, you know, do you have any words of advice? I was saying, well. If you're going to do anything, score a try or two against England. It serves you well for the rest of your career. Yeah, no kidding. No <laughs> kidding. That was a good tournament for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stephen, any final questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pro 14, final question, new TV deal. Big, yeah. or big news? It wasn't really a value. I didn't see a value anywhere. Any? I have to say it now. I'm, yeah. I have to say I've got a little bit maybe one-eyed because I, I've worked for Sky for a number of years, but I was very surprised that they didn't go with this Sky deal and the reach that Sky gives them, the you know production values gone with um, a you know a, a pretty unheralded um, yeah. a pay-per-view um, uh, is, is channel. It, is it pay-per-view or is it free to air? I thought no, it was every no. game live. No, um, and certainly not in, in England anyway. I think there is a, a, a um, the Irish um, network is air. I think there will be some free to air, but the majority of them are, are behind the paywall f- for a, a pretty unheralded uh, channel in, in Premier uh, Sports. So, um, you know, I know there's the more. Two m- Irish guys? There's the, more. The, the, yes, the it is. Brothers, yeah, you're right. right. Yeah. Are they brothers? Uh, I'm not sure. I think. Like one's uh, on one coast and one's on the other. Because those are the guys that. That hold us hostage for the matches here with the person at the door collecting the money. That's the that's the, they just changed the name to those Premier criminals. Sports. Those criminals. Uh-huh. But it's, I tell you, it's uh, it's it's uh, remains to be seen how that works for for um, um, Pro 14 Rugby because they had a very big reach and they're, it's going to be less so. So I, I think maybe they've made some more money, but I, I I'm a real believer in, in making sure as many people can can see the game as possible, and yeah. there's a value for that, and everyone sponsors, and there's a value for that in getting more young players. To to play and the visibility by players, so um, I think it's a bit of a risk. And um, acts of I, desperation. I hope. I just hope it works because yeah. that, given the changes with the South African teams, is a, it's a big deal. And, and that, interestingly enough, is is one of the things MLR here has done really, really well. It's if you're going to proselytize and evangelize the game, it needs to be free to people. And yeah. You're going to grow it. Yeah, I've done a good job with that. I think that's a brilliant idea. It's one of the things, the conversations we've I've had with James as well. Get this out to as big a market as possible. Don't put any constraints on people getting watching the game. Allow them to enjoy it allow them to find out about it and and uh, be part of, of of rugby culture and you embrace don't physical it. constraints no no, <laughs> no no physical constraints at all but um i really do think that uh, uh, the more people who can watch it the more people will fall in love with it and that's what we want all right we want love ladies and gentlemen is uh, that shane horgan we can't top that as a final statement mr stephen lewis thank you mr shane horgan Thanks. thank you thank you Matt McCarthy, on behalf of both of these gentlemen from the Fantasy Sports Network, Studio 34 in Midtown Manhattan, talking rugby, signing off.